Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Leonard Adrian. He's a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, and he served as a hospital corpsman in the Korean War. He wrote about his experiences in Korea in a book entitled Hilltop Doc, a Marine corpsman fighting through the mud and blood of the Korean War. And Mr. Adrian, it's great to have you with us. Thanks so much for your time. Glad to be here. Thank you. Let's start with the beginning of your story. Where were you born and raised? Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. And in 1926, if you can believe that. Oh, fantastic. Uh, what memories do you have of the attack on Pearl Harbor? Well, I was shocked by everybody else uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. Um, I don't remember exactly how I got the news of that attack, but uh, I listened to President Roosevelt and his speech to the Congress. Uh, and uh, I've heard it many times since because they repeat it from time to time. But uh, Pearl Harbor was a shock and it started a, a terrible war for the United States, of course. And you are a World War II veteran, although you did not go overseas. Talk about getting drafted into the Navy and what type of uh, training and experiences that led to it towards the end of the war. Yes, I was. Uh, I graduated high school in 1944 and was drafted into the Navy, as you said. I reported to Great Lakes Naval Training Center. And one of the things that impressed me up there was that they showed a film of all the different jobs that were available in the Navy. And I thought that was wonderful. I can select the job I want. So I selected to become an aerographer's mate, which is a guy who's on an aircraft carrier predicting weather conditions for the pilots. And the Navy came back and said, congratulations, you are in the hospital corps. And I said, no, 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 I, you got that wrong. I don't want to be in the hospital corps. I don't like sick people and blood. And, and uh, that's not the kind of thing I want to do. But the Navy said, that's what we need. And therefore, you are in the hospital corps. They sent me to a gorgeous place in the mountains of uh, Idaho called Farragut. And they gave me training there, which is... Uh, uh, training in first aid and general uh, care of uh, people who are ill or people who have been hurt. And then uh, when I graduated there, I was a hospital corpsman third class. They sent me to my final duty during World War II, which was at Northwestern University because we were going to decommission the V-12 base there. It was fantastic duty for me because I lived on the second floor of Patton Gymnasium. I'm a basketball nut, I'm a basketball player, and I got to play with the, uh, work out with the team and travel with the football and basketball team because there were Navy guys on the team. And then of course the war ended in August of 45 and shortly thereafter I was released. But I made a mistake. <laughs> I, was, I was told that I could join the Naval Reserve and they said I could go to meetings and get paid $8 to go to a meeting. And my dad had told me, because we grew up during the Depression and we had no money, never, ever turn down an opportunity to make a buck. And I said, well, the war's over. They're not going to need me anymore. And so I signed up for the Naval Reserve. I never went to a meeting, of course. And of course, when I got home, I found out that there was a thing called the GI Bill. And it enabled me to go to college. And so I went to college for four years. Graduated in 1950, in June of 1950, and then of course on June 25th of 1950, Korean War broke out, and I got the letter, you're activated, and I'm reporting back to Great Lakes Naval Training Center, so I, I kind of did a circle there. But then you got another surprise because you weren't going back to the Navy. They wanted you in the Marine Corps. Well, the Navy corpsmen uh, are still in the Navy. The Marine Corps has no medical. So Navy doctors and Navy corpsmen serve the Marines. And yes, I was assigned uh, eventually to the Fleet Marine Force, sent to Camp Pendleton for pre-Korean training. And our drill instructor was a guy who had already been to Korea, been wounded by shrapnel, came back. And, uh, and so he gave us the uh, what it was going to be like to be in those hills and fighting the Chinese uh, at the 38th parallel. And, uh, and of course, I went on a ship 
with my carbine and um, full Navy gear, my great big backpack, and 5,500 Marines and I uh, on the uh, on the ship arrived in Pusan 19, 20 days later. And as I read in the book, they didn't really refresh your medical training much. You pretty much had to rely on what you learned back at the end of World War II, correct? Yes, that was uh, that was true, and that didn't set well with me because I, I the handbook of the hospital corps, which was what we worked from, was long gone, and uh, the training at Pendleton was really a mini boot camp for Marines. I mean, we had to climb over the walls and, and uh, do a amphibious landing off of a ship, and. Uh, and crawl under a live machine gun fire and things like that, which with all the Marines went through and didn't have much time for a medical. The, the uh, corpsmen uh, w- w- that were in my group, we talked about the medical and we tried to refresh our own memories. And the drill instructor who had been treated by corpsmen, very high on the treatment he got because there he was back there and doing well, uh, we learned, we learned a little, but we arrived in Korea feeling really inadequate for the task and uh, nervous about that. And so what was the contrast like between training for something like this and actually being part of it on the battlefield? Well, of course, uh, the big difference was the fact that when you're climbing a hill and trying to dislodge the Chinese who are at the top of the hill, you're experiencing enemy fire and the mortars are coming in and they're exploding and the uh, burp guns of the uh, Chinese uh, soldier is going bump, 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 bump at us and uh, artillery shells are coming in and we've, we've got to run up the hill in four uh, fire teams alter- alternating because we don't want to uh, go in mass and uh, so it, it's, it's an entirely different experience. Although we just, they were describing it to us at Camp Pendleton, and uh, it was very much as it was described. But until you get there, until you see the smoke, until you feel the uh, pressure, until you understand the uh, the uh, trying to get your orders uh, with noise uh, of explosions and people yelling and the Chinese uh, banging their cymbals and screaming at you and uh, it's a whole different kind of experience. What was the protocol? Uh, obviously, there are different types of wounds, different types of treatment needed. But what was kind of your checklist, if that's the right word, for when you were called to attend to someone? Well, it was in uh, on the hillsides, there was a limited amount that you could do. The first order of business is to stop the bleeding. Because if you don't stop the bleeding, the Marine will bleed out and he's gone. So... When I was first called, the first time it happened, the guy yelled Corman, and I went up there, and, and there he was. He was moving and writhing in pain on the ground, and I had to get to his wound, and so I took my shears out, and I cut away his jacket and cut away his uh, undershirt and all that, and he was hit in the middle, somewhere around in the stomach, and the blood was oozing out, and I grabbed my bandages, and I put the bandages on the wound, and I held them very tight, and there was a corporal that was with him, and I told the corporal, put your pressure hands on these bandages, and you hold them there until the blood stops oozing out. The the other thing is, in order for him to be quiet enough to be treated, I, I gave him a morphine shot, and that has a pretty strong effect on calming down a wounded Marine. And we carried little surrettes with us in our uh, med kit, and uh, and they were already preloaded. It was very simple to, you know, give him an injection there. Beyond that, and other than tagging him to tell the people that would be picking him up, which we call the stretcher bearers, guys, uh, we I just wrote what I did. He was stable, and the stretcher guys would come and take him down to the forward aid uh, uh, tent, which was at the bottom of the hill. That was the protocol for most of the immediacy of the wounded. 
we had other circumstances sometimes because if a, if a leg was broken or an arm was broken, uh, we would try to immobilize it, you know, take some wood sticks, whatever we had up there and, uh, and, and treat it as best we could. So it wouldn't be, uh, worsened by the trauma of going on the stretcher and going down the hill. And so it was that sort of thing that we had to do over and over again. How much or how little time did you have to tend to these men when you're in the midst of live fire action? Oh, very little time. We were on the way up the hill. So uh, it was done very fast. And, uh, and we, would, we would have to different Every time a corpsman was called to a Marine, First thing I had to do is find out whether he was okay or not, whether the meaning he was alive or not. If he was not alive, and you can tell that pretty quickly, we moved on to the next person who was injured. When somebody's injured, then we tagged them, and we we usually uh, hit their rifle in the ground, put their helmet on top, which signaled to the stretcher bearers that this is a guy that needs to be treated and needs to be taken down the hill to the uh, med tent down below. So um, it was very fast. We, I couldn't get way behind my platoon because there were two corpsmen in each of platoon and Sammy, my other corpsman, and I were the only ones in that platoon that would take care of the guys if they get hit and when they get hit. So I, 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 had, I had to move on pretty quickly. Sir, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking with Leonard Adrian, a veteran of the Korean War. He served as a hospital corpsman during that war. We'll talk more about his experience when we come back on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Columbus. honored to be joined today by Leonard Adrian, a veteran of the U.S. Navy as well as a veteran of the Korean War. He served as a hospital corpsman in the U.S. Navy attached to the 1st Marine Division in Korea. And we were just talking about uh, the protocols and what it was like to tend to uh, fallen soldiers in the midst of live fire and fighting on a hillside. And, sir, let's pick up there because so much of the fighting in Korea was done either defending a hill or, or attacking a hill. How did that complicate your job? Well, the, um, of course, it was difficult because we had hard terrain. We also had to fight weather conditions. And the worst weather conditions probably were the fall and the spring and the winter. And, and the reason for that was there's so much uh, rain, snow, sleet, ice and uh, you're going up a hill when it's snowing or where there's uh, been snow and there's icy on the uh, hill to- hillsides it's very hard to get traction uh, even the summer was tough because in the heat of the summer in korea at the 38th parallel where i was the uh, the summer was very hot and humid and the uh, and the mosquitoes were bigger than than birds at least we thought they were and and so we had to fight the weather and we had to fight the conditions uh, of the topography. And uh, so it never, it never got easy. It always was hard. And uh, we had to do it over and over again. And one of the most frustrating things was that we would go up a hill, we would take the hill, we would dig in at the top, we solidified our position, and then the Chinese would counterattack. Uh, and if it's not us, it's our replacements were counterattacked. And they would be pushed off the hill or we would be pushed off the hill and forced to go back down to the bottom where the main service road was. And, uh, and we would have to take that hill back again because our task in Korea when I was there was to take and hold the high ground and to kill and maim as many of the enemy as possible on the theory that that would uh, force the uh, Chinese to uh, uh, go to the bargaining table and execute a peace agreement or a ceasefire. And that took a long time because the, the, the talks at Pan Lum John started around July of 51 and the actual ceasefire agreement was signed on July 27th, 1953. So during all that time, we were fighting to hold and, and to keep a high ground. We were not there to take extra territory. The Chinese were not trying to take territory either. They wanted to do the same thing we did, 
So we each had the same goal, but it was it was a very frustrating thing to to lose a lot of men, take a hill, solidify ourselves, lose the hill, and lose a lot more men taking the hill than the casualty rates in Korea when I was there, and average uh, 4,000 casualties a month. So it was a very intense experience. One of the things you also talk about Excuse me. One of the things you also talk about in the book, Mr. Adrian, is the difference in approach that the United States took to tending to the wounded as opposed to the Chinese who just basically left their men there. What kind of an impact did that have on you? Yes, there was a difference. And Marine Corps policy is never leave anybody behind. And you've heard that before, probably. And we we executed that almost perfect, perfectly as, as best we could. So that if we had a wounded Marine, we made sure that he was taken down the hill uh, and treated. If we had a dead Marine, we didn't leave his body on the hillside either. We took him down the hill to start the long, sad journey home. But the Chinese were different. They seemed to have an unlimited supply of men. They seemed to have almost a suicidal approach to their fighting because they would come at us, we'd kill a lot of them, they'd come some more, and it never seemed to end. But when it was over and we got to the top of the hill, uh, there were wounded Marines and there were wounded Chinese. And we treated the Chinese who were wounded, stabilized them as best we could, and then sent them down the hill with stretcher bearers uh, if they couldn't walk, and most of them could not. And uh, they became prisoners of war. The dead Chinese, we would have to stack our bodies on the north slope of the hill, and then eventually we would have to bury those bodies in shallow graves because of the deterioration of the body creates a, a odor condition that's almost intolerable. So that's what we had to do relative to the Chinese. We're talking with Leonard Adrian, veteran of the Korean War, as a Navy hospital corpsman. And, sir, we're just about a minute away from another break here. But talk about how you kept it together psychologically, uh, seeing so much trauma in such a compact period of time. You know, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't analyze my own mind. Uh, but um, it's so intense, and the activity is so furiously uh, ongoing that there's no real time to think about what's happening. You just do it. You're there. This is your responsibility. The Marines are depending upon you. And uh, we just continue to do what was necessary. And at least I, speaking for myself, I didn't find anything other than I was glad to get through the, taking the hill. I was glad to be on top in my foxhole or my barricade. I was also very happy when the uh, relief group came and, uh, and let us go back to the battalion base where we got a little rest and, and refreshed ourselves before the next uh, hill to take. We'll take a quick break now. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. Our guest today, Leonard Adrian, veteran of the U.S. Navy and a veteran of the Korean War. I'm Greg Columbus. We'll be right back. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbert. I'm Greg Corumbus. We are honored today to be joined by Leonard Adrian. He's a veteran of the U.S. Navy, and he served as a hospital corpsman attached to the 1st U.S. Marine Division in the Korean War. And, sir, just before the break, we were talking about the mindset required to keep going in this traumatic atmosphere and constantly dealing with wounded soldiers, and in many cases, as you also discussed in the last segment, even tending to the wounded enemy. There are at least two different stories in this book that I want to get your thoughts on briefly because they're so clearly personal uh, and emotional for you. One relates to another corpsman uh, who you refer to as Derry in the book. You actually made a bet with him at one point as to who would live longer, and uh, ultimately he was killed and, and he was wounded in such a way that you didn't even recognize him uh, when he came back into where you were. Uh, explain that story a little bit and the impact it had on you. Yeah, Derry was really my best friend uh, at the Camp Pendleton training uh, before we went to Korea. He and I hung out together on the ship, uh, the USS General Meigs, on the way over. So we were very close. And, and Derry and I did make that strange bet 
that uh, that I think I talked about in the book um, who would who would uh, who would survive and who would not survive if somebody didn't survive. Uh, how would you collect the money from the uh, from the bed? But um, but when when Derry and I got to our battalion base, we were separated because he was in one company, I was in dog company, and uh, so we were alternating. He goes up a hill, and I was back at the battalion aid station. And my job there was to uh, help the doc service the people who were coming in on stretchers from the battle. And one time, a stretcher came in, and uh, the Marine was covered with mud, covered with blood. He was uh, in very, very bad shape. His bat, this whole left side of his face was kind of ripped apart, and, uh, and, and he was pretty much in terrible, terrible condition. And the doc told me right away, we can't handle this here. He's got to get to the hospital ship. And we had a copter pad on the uh, battalion base, and we had copters that come and go and take the wounded down to the hospital ship, which is off the south coast of Korea. So he said, Adrian, take this guy and get him to the, hospital, the copter pad as soon as possible. We got him there. The copter was fortunately there. They took off heading south. And the next day I was in the battalion aid station, and, uh, and there was quiet time. We were looking over the papers and everything from of people we treated yesterday, and there was Derry's name. And I told the doc, I said, I didn't see Derry. He wasn't here. He says, oh, yeah, Adrian, you treated him. In fact, I told you to rush him to the copter pad in order to get to the hospital ship because he was in really bad shape. And I went to the copter pad then after I got off of duty, and I waited for the copter guy to come back from one of his trips, and I asked him what happened to the guy that I brought over there, and he shook his head, and he said, I'm sorry, but he never made it to the hospital ship. And so I treated Derry, my best friend, and I didn't even know that I was treating my best friend. And that was hard. Extremely hard. And we're going to get to another story related to that in just a moment, but I think this is a good time to talk about one of the key points you want to make in the book, because... Obviously, whether it's in, in the media or Hollywood, war tends to be glamorized and sensationalized. And one of the key points you make throughout this book is that war is nothing like that. That's correct. In fact, uh, one of the reasons I didn't uh, communicate with people when I came back from Korea in 1952 was that we had decided among us, when I, when I got my orders to leave the battalion, uh, I was going to be coptered out to Maison, which is the 1st Marine Division headquarters on the south coast of Korea. And my platoon members and my friends came to the copter pad and we had a conversation while we waited for the copter. And what we decided was that we were going to put the Korean War in the past. We were move on into the future. We were not going to exchange those names and addresses and, uh, and, and go to meetings and reunions and join military groups and anything. And, and so when I came home, I, I followed that to the letter. And when I got home in 1952, and my dad and my mother and my brother wanted to know all about what happened because I hadn't written much about what actually happened. And I told them, no, we're not gonna talk about it. And they were okay with that. They were glad I was home and I was okay. And the next year I married my wife and my wife would tell you if you, ask her that for more than 60 years, even though she knew I was in Korea, not a word was said about what happened in Korea. So that's kind of the way we dealt with that, at least the way I dealt with that. And we'll talk about how that changed in just a few minutes. But another story in the book along those same lines uh, deals with a lead lieutenant that you referred to simply as Big Mike. As you were advancing on a hill, he took actions that saved the lives of, of the whole group of you and then ultimately he lost his own life. So uh, talk about that story and the impact it had on you because it was a very emotional response that you had. Yeah, that was my worst, I think, my worst day in Korea. We, we, uh, we gathered at the bottom as we did. Mike was not a lieutenant, he was a sergeant. And uh, he, he was in charge of the squad. And we were very close and we were going up the hill as we always did in fire teams. 
And Mike was uh, working next to a, a BAR guy, and the BAR guy has a, uh, an assistant over. The, um, the, the ammunition that he has to carry. And uh, his BAR guy was hit, and Mike went to him right away to help him. And on the way to help him, uh, I heard the rat-a-tat-tat of the burp gun, and Mike was hit. And I was not very far behind, so I rushed over to Mike, and he grabbed his neck, and he was twisting and turning and gyrating on the ground. And I grabbed my bandages, and I went to his neck, and I pushed the bandages hard and hard and hard, and I couldn't stop the bleeding. And it didn't take long before Mike's eyes glazed over, and he was gone, and it was so traumatic. And that was after Mike had found a, uh, had picked up a grenade, which was thrown at us, and it was right next to me, and right next to Mike, and right next to other members of his group, and he picked it up and he tossed it into a, a gully and the thing exploded and it vibrated around the hill and he saved us all. And only after that, he got killed himself. And um, we were down at the bottom of the hill because we retreated right after that. And the Chinese came after us and they had really won the battle. And, uh, and then we, the battle stopped the Chinese were satisfied that they pushed us away. They were going up to the top of the hill. <clears throat> we were we were sending the stretcher bearers up to get our wounded or get our dead. And I couldn't stand it that Mike was up there alone. Uh, and so I went up to the hill to find him, and I found him. And he was laying there, his eyes staring at the sky with unseeing eyes staring at the sky. And I, I wiped the blood from his from his mouth, from his face, it was all blood black, black and clotted. And I closed his eyes very gently, and I yelled for stretcher bearers. And for the first time, and the only time in Korea, I actually carried somebody down the hill. I told the stretcher bearer I wanted to be part of it, and so he and I uh, took Mike down the hill. And, uh, and when that was over, I, I was very upset. I went behind a boulder. I took my helmet off. I pushed my wet rifle aside, and I actually uh, teared up thinking about what happened. And I was, I was furious, and I was sad, and I was angry. I was, I, I was hurt. It was the ultimate picture of what happens in a war, and it really shook me. And uh, I think somewhere in the book I said that I was never quite the same after that. That's exactly right. Um... Let's talk a little bit about your interaction with the Korean people. You talk about some of the pejoratives that were used on the boat over uh, to Korea about the enemies in the North Korea and, and in China. You had some very good experiences, not all good experiences, but mostly good experiences with the South Korean people, including one person who uh, took great pride in making a nameplate for your desk. So talk about what you learned about the, the Korean people. Yes, I actually... Um the Korean people that I knew or found uh, in Korea were, were kind and compassionate. And of course, they'd been through hell because they'd been through the Japanese occupation, many of them, for a long period of time. The Japanese were brutal to the Koreans, as they were brutal to other people as well. And then they had to experience the invasion of the North Koreans against them to the south and all the trauma that went with that. And, uh, and so they were traumatized people, but they wanted to help. And we had Korean people at our base that would uh, help us by delivering water, which is heavy, uh, to the troops to take up the hill and supplies. And one, one guy was always there for me. Uh, he liked me for some reason. And whenever I went up the hill, with uh, went up to the 38th parallel, he was there to send me off and smiled at me and good luck, Adrian, and that kind of thing. And um, one time, um, he and I, I had a very bad day up on the hill. And I lost two or three friends and I was feeling very low. And, 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 and he said, uh, we lose, uh, you know, what happened? 
we, he had a, a limited amount of English that he could speak, but we, we communicated. And uh, he saw that I was distressed. And uh, he said, I make you feel better. Do you have a desk at home? I said, yeah, you have a name on the desk? I said, no, just a desk. He said, good. And so later on, when I got orders to go, and I knew I was going to be leaving, and we're trying to say goodbye, he brought me this little uh, little thing with my name on it. I have it right over here in the corner. I could get it if you want me to. But, but uh, it was like mother of pearl into a piece of triangular black wood that would fit on my desk. And, uh, and it all just said L.J. Adrian. And, and he gave it to me, and we hugged, and, and we said goodbye. And, uh, and uh, he was very kind, and he was good to me, and he wished me good luck, and I, I reciprocated with him. I had another good experience with the Korean people because I ended up in a village by myself when I got separated from my unit. And I was laying on the ground off the road, and I was all bloody from going through the woods and the thickets and thorns or whatever it was. And I was full of mud and blood. And, and I, I, I kind of woke up and there was this elderly Korean man standing over me. And he motioned for me to follow him. And he took me into his hut. And then he asked these women that were there, older women, uh, to clean me up. And they... they brought water and they washed the dirt and the mud and everything, the blood off of me. And then he came back with some bowls of rice with some food in it and he treated it. And I, we're not supposed to eat the Korean food. And that was rule number one or two or three about food. But I was famished and I ate the rice and I ate the vegetables that he had in the rice. And when it was over, I knew I had to get back to my unit. So I stood and he stood and we bowed to each other and uh, that was our way of saying thank you. We couldn't speak words because he didn't know my English and I didn't know his Korean. But, and then I left, and it was a very kind and wonderful thing that he did. Uh, just a couple minutes in this segment, Mr. Adrian. Let's talk a little bit about not only your interaction with the Korean people then, but what you see there now. And before we get into some of the, the current headlines, just over the past 60 years, the difference between North Korea and South Korea and the impact that, that you and the other Americans and the other allies had in keeping South Koreans free? Well, of course, the difference is amazing because uh, South Korea is a country of 50 million people and prosperous. North Korea is a country of 25 million people and impoverished. And... Um, I got to know some Korean people here in St. Louis because my grandson-in-law, who married my granddaughter, Kelly, uh, is a Korean-American. And at the wedding, all of his family came, and we had a nice uh, chat, and they were very proud that I was a Marine in, in Korea, and they felt grateful that we did some things there for him. So so uh, big difference in the South Koreans. Uh, are, are good people, and they're successful, and uh, North Korea, of course, a mess. Clearly the case. And so now that, let's talk a little bit about uh, the current events. Obviously, there's kind of this nuclear standoff. It appears in recent days, as we record this in August of 2017, that the North Koreans have backed down a little bit in terms of their threat to launch missiles near Guam. But the nuclear threat from North Korea has intensified from time to time for a number of decades now. So given your experience in that theater, what comes to mind when the story flares up? Well, the uh, the news out of Korea after 64 years is distressing, disturbing, and uh, a little bit for me disgusting. And uh, there's two things that bother me about the situation. The first thing that bothers me is the 28,000 troops that we have in Korea, in South Korea. and. Uh, those troops are there as a sacrificial deterrent, in my opinion. 28,000 troops are not going to do anything against a 1 million plus uh, army by uh, the North Koreans. And, and so my opinion is that South Korea must be motivated to build up its military so it can defend itself. And we must not fight another war in Korea on the ground. 
we can give them airplanes, we can give them missiles, we can give them uh, drones, we can give them armaments, we can give them tanks, we can do anything we can to help them, but we ought to withdraw those 28,000 troops. As far as the nuclear is concerned, it's really a serious problem with Kim Jong-un and his unpredictability. And uh, even though he's not going to send missiles to Guam, if the uh, credible intelligence is that he's got them uh, with an inter intercontinental missile and a nuclear warhead that he can attach and guide it and bring it to a, a target, it seems to me that our only avenue that's re really peaceful is through China. China, who came across the Yellow River with hundreds of thousands of troops in, in November 1950, owes us because they're the ones who killed most of the Americans in that terrible war a long time ago. And they have the power and they have the influence to convince a uh, North Korean's leader who says he's there, he's only doing this uh, buildup of intercontinental missiles and nuclear because he's afraid he's going to be attacked. China can guarantee that he won't be attacked because China will guarantee his survival. And, and, if China does that in exchange for his agreement to dismantle his nuclear, we've got a solution. I don't know if China can do it or will do it. If they, if, he do, if they don't do it, then it seems to me that we've got to approach along with our allies like Australia and Japan who are vulnerable uh, to covertly try to get uh, Kim Jong-un out of office and maybe a moderate will take his place. I don't know if there are moderates that will take his place or could take his place, but that's a worth an effort. If all of that fails and he's got a verifiable missile that will hit Guam or Hawaii or the U.S., I think we've got to take him out. And I think that's, of course, the worst solution and a very dangerous solution. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid that that's what it can come to if we can't get China or the, uh, or the uh, regime change accomplished. Mr. Adrian, let's pause one more time. We'll be back with the final parts of Leonard Adrian's story from the Korean War when we come back on Veterans Chronicles. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest today is Leonard Adrian, hospital corpsman attached to the 1st U.S. Marine Division in the Korean War. He is also the author of Hilltop Doc, a Marine corpsman fighting through the mud and blood of the Korean War. And, sir, as we discussed earlier about how war is not glamorous, war is as ugly as we can get pretty much in the human experience, that you did not tell your story to your family, you didn't tell your story even to your wife for decades and decades, but ultimately something changed. Why did you decide to start telling your story? What happened was that I uh, facilitate a couple of writing courses at something called Lifelong Learning at Washington University in St. Louis. And a friend of mine, Dick Hyde, came to me because he was facilitating a course on the Korean War. And he had about 55 students taking the course, and he said he'd like me to appear there for 15, 20 minutes and answer a few of their questions because they hadn't seen anybody that actually had been there during that war. I went there and 15 to 20 minutes evolved into an hour and then another hour, another hour and over multiple weeks. And they had all kinds of detailed questions that they wanted to know, like some of those that you asked me, but more than that, they wanted to know what kind of weapons I carried and why did I have uh, three different weapons that... Uh, that they didn't think Corman carried weapons, and, and they wanted to know what I wore, and they wanted all kinds of things that I never thought anybody would care about. They wanted to know what a foxhole was like, and why we dug these foxholes and these barricades when we got on top of the mountain. And so I answered their questions, and I found out something remarkable, and that is that my memory of all that detail all those years ago was very crisp, very clear, very vivid. So the faculty there said, hey, you got to write some of this down. So I did. I wrote some of it down in little vignettes, shared it with my memoir class. And Ruby Lapp and my co-facilitator said, you got to write a book. And so I said, you know, I don't know if I want to write a book. And she said, you got to write a book because you got to tell what happened there in realistic terms. And I thought about it and thought about it. And then I thought about the 38,000 that uh, were, were killed. 
and the 103,000 wounded and the 8,000 that are still missing. And I said, I owe it to them to pay honor to them by writing a book. And so I did. I wrote, I wrote Hilltop Doc and, and I dedicated it on the back with the purple heart showing that the book is dedicated to the servicemen and women whose future was lost or damaged in the Korean War. And that's what really motivated me to write the book. And, and so that's what happened. Was it painful or cathartic? You know, that's a good question. I, I think it was painful, uh, but it was also maybe cathartic. And as I told you before, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't know what the effect is. But I do know that people have said that if you write your memoir, and we talk about this in the memoir class, and you have problems that you're writing about, it's somehow it's good to get them out of your system and good to put it down and good to share it with somebody you want to share it with. And so maybe that was good. At least it's out there now for everybody to see. And, uh, and I'm proud of the book. I think, I think it's an honest report of what happened and how it happened to me and how I, got, how I went from a 17-year-old kid being drafted to a 25-year-old guy uh, many years later on the 38th parallel in Korea. And that's the journey uh, that, that uh, I took. And I, I think it's uh, as, as honest an effort as I could make. Let's talk briefly about the intervening 65 years. What did you do after coming home? Because I know you did not choose to stay in the service. No, I did not. In fact, I turned down the opportunity for, for a commission uh, when I got to Newport, Rhode Island, after I finally came back from Korea because I didn't want to stay in service. I thought that there was a different career path for me. And so I, I came back to St. Louis. I, uh, I, got a, I, I went to work. Uh, uh, co-founded a, a company called the Siteman Organization. We were real estate developers. We built buildings and managed and operated buildings in St. Louis and Denver and, and Houston and some other places. And uh, I did that for 36 years. And then I uh, became a mediator, arbitrator, um, uh, expert witness uh, for another um, 17 years. And I retired. In the interim, I, I became president of the Building Owners and Managers Association, which is the national organization that uh, services the office building industry. And I had this opportunity to appear before Congress, Senate committees, the House committees, work with uh, President Reagan's uh, Council for Economic Advisor, Murray Wiedenbaum, and met, actually met President Reagan in the course of all that. So. I was able to give more service, and I was also very active in some charitable work here in St. Louis, and I still am. Final question, what are you most proud of from your time in service? I'm most proud of the 1st Marine Division and the, the esprit de corps that the Marines have and how they pick up for each other, help each other, protect each other, and fight hard for the objective that's given to them. I, I, I can't stop being uh, in awe of the uh, Marine Corps as a fighting unit for the United States of America. Mr. Adrian, thank you so much for your service to our country, and thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Leonard Adrian, veteran of the Korean War, served as a, med as a hospital corpsman in the Korean War. His book is Hilltop Doc, a Marine corpsman fighting through the mud and blood of the Korean War. I'm Greg Columbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.